Well, good morning to you, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday morning walk with the Apostles for this Wednesday, April the 7th. It's good to be with you this morning. As always, I hope and trust that your day has gotten off to a great start. We're going to begin, as we do, with a word of prayer, and then we'll get right back into looking at some uh, principles of conflict resolution from Acts chapter 15. Let's bow. Father, we're so grateful for your blessings in our lives and for your being with us. There are so many things that, that you do and provide for us that we very often take for granted. And Father, we never want to do that. But we always want to be mindful of your blessings and to be grateful and to express our gratitude to you. And Father, as we look into Acts 15 again for conflict resolution principles, we pray that you would bless us in our study, that we'll not only see these, but we'll think about them, reflect on them, and practice them in our lives. Because as much as we, as we try to do better and, do, and be different, conflicts come. And uh, we never want them to be a source of, of um, uh, separation, but rather we want to work through them and, and uh, profess and, and practice a unity together. We pray, Father, for our, those that are sick physically, uh, whether it be COVID or whatever other problems they ha are having, with those that are having surgery or have had surgery, uh, we just lift them all up and those that are caring for them. Father, we pray again for our nation. We continue to do that. And we know that while things don't look good right now and we don't like the direction many, many things are going in our country, uh, that we, you work through us to change things and help us to do what we can. Above all, Father, we thank you for, for Jesus and his coming and giving his life for our sins. And we pray to all this in his name. Amen. Well, in this morning's walk, we are continuing to look at conflict resolution from Acts chapter 15, verses 1 to 35. We've seen nine principles, and I want to see three more today uh, as we uh, wrap up this part of uh, chapter 15. So, principle number 10, be able to concede gracefully. When James finished his speech and his recommendation, a remarkable and wonderful thing happened. The whole congregation came to an agreement. Verse 22 says, Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to write the letter to the congregation at Antioch as James recommended. In the letter, they noted that, quote, it seemed good to us, having become of one mind, end quote, to do this, verse 25. Apparently, the circumcision binders conceded to the inspired judgment of Peter, Paul, Barnabas, and James. If that is the case, and it seems likely, then they were bigger men than many today who insist on having their way or else. Unless an issue involves a spiritual principle that we cannot compromise, when the majority's preference differs from our personal preferences, we should defer to the majority and make the decision unanimous. Principle number 11, keep it personal. Now I mentioned several things about the letter that they wrote uh, last Thursday, uh, touching on the personal nature of it. So let me just mention here the fact that the brethren in Jerusalem did not depend on the letter alone. They sent two men with the letter. They made sure their 
response had the personal touch. Letters can undoubtedly have value. I mean, 21 of the 27 books of the New Testament are letters. It's often good to get everything down in writing. On the other hand, I have seen letters fuel the flames of controversy instead of extinguishing them, especially letters that are written in the heat of passion. I would also include here the sending of letters anonymously. Surely every Christian realizes the few, that few acts are more cowardly than sending a letter of criticism anonymously. Letters have built-in shortcomings. If the reader misunderstands the intent of the letter, the writer is not there to explain what he or she really meant. If the letter contains words that can be taken as criticism, those words are not said once as they could be in a face-to-face -face discussion. Rather, the recipient invariably reads them over and over again, becoming more and more ha unhappy each time. And a third shortcoming is that controversial letters can be saved, filed, and shared with any number of people, spreading the controversy like a grass fire. If you are involved in a church controversy, my advice concerning letters is twofold. First, if you must write a letter, do so with the sensitivity of those who compose the letter from Jerusalem. As a general rule, do not write a letter while you are upset. Or if you do, wait several days before you send it, and then reread it carefully and prayerfully several times before sending it. Number two, if it is at all possible, to talk directly with the other party. Do not write the letter. Now, someone may object, but I cannot think when I'm in front of someone else. I express myself better in a letter. Well, then learn from the brethren in Jerusalem. Write your letter, but deliver it in person. Be there to explain and answer questions as it is read. In your dealings with others, always keep the personal touch. And then principle number 12, keep a positive attitude. Believe it or not, good can come from controversy. If we maintain positive attitudes and handle the matter in the right way. Controversy may bring into the open problems that should have been dealt with long before. Controversy may force us to restudy issues and bring us closer to an understanding of the will of God. Controversy may force us to work on relationships that we have long neglected. Verses 30 to 35 tell of the positive results from the proper handling of the Acts 15 controversy. First, there was rejoicing. Paul and Barnabas, along with the representatives from Jerusalem, quote, went down to Antioch, 
and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when it had and when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. That's verses 30 and 31 in Acts 15. The brethren at Antioch were encouraged because the decision had been made that Gentiles did not have to keep the law. They were encouraged because the controversy was over. And they were encouraged because the requests were made were not difficult. Secondly, God's word continued to be preached. In verse 32, And Judas and Silas, also being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. Verse 35 notes that Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, teaching and preaching with many others also the word of the Lord. Number three, relationships between the Jews and the Gentiles were strengthened. Verse 33 says that, quote, after they, that is Judas and Silas, had spent some time there, they were sent away from the brethren in peace to those who had sent them out, end quote. Now, to be sent in peace to those who had sent them out indicated that the brethren in Antioch appreciated the men who had come and those who had sent them. Keeping a positive attitude in the midst of controversy is hard. Grab hold of the Lord's promise that he will cause all things to work together for good to them that love the Lord. Romans 8, 28, and do not turn loose of that. Well, in Acts 15, 1 to 35, we have discovered many principles, 12 in all, to help us deal with, contra uh, with congregational controversy, whether it is a doctrinal disagreement, like the one solved in Acts 15, or a difference of opinion. How can we summarize what we have studied? Well, I like this formula for unity derived from Acts 15. Preach grace, practice love. Peter said, we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, verse 11. In today's morning walk devotional and the two previous on Monday and Tuesday, we have tried to stress being humble, considerate, unselfish, and sensitive, all of which could be summarized by the word love. Regardless of the nature of the disagreement, Paul's admonition of 1 Corinthians 16 verse 14 still applies. Let all that you do be done in love. Even when you must stand up for the truth, do it without being hateful. Ephesians 4.15 May God help us always to show love in both words and deeds. Now, we're a little shorter today, but this is where we need to, to break uh, in, our, in our thinking. Tomorrow, uh, I want to ask and answer a question regarding the prohibitions James suggested as a part of the letter in chapter 15, verse 20 and 29. And then in the remaining time tomorrow and continuing on to Friday, I want to look at the conclusion, concluding verses of Acts 15. Now, before we have a prayer and close, let me say that tomorrow's video will not be live. Linda and I both have doctor appointments tomorrow uh, in Amarillo. 
Uh, one of hers is actually a pre-admit for her surgery that is a week from tomorrow, uh, back surgery uh, on the 15th. So this afternoon, I'm going to actually record tomorrow's morning walk and uh, we'll post it sometime uh, early tomorrow morning before we leave to go to Amarillo. So it'll be available earlier, but as I said, it, it will not be live. Hope you can join with it and watch it as it, uh, as it airs. Anyway, thanks for being with us today, and let's close this morning in prayer. Loving Father, we're grateful for your blessings and your watching over us, and we thank you for these principles that we can draw, all 12 of them, that we can draw from uh, Acts 15, and that we can make applicable in our lives as we deal with the inevitable differences and controversies that come into our lives. Help us, Father, to strive in love and in grace to uh, be adherents to your word and to uh, be unified together as your body, the, or excuse me, the body of Christ upon this earth. Thank you for Jesus and his coming, and we pray this all in his name. Amen. Well, make your Wednesday a great one. Lord willing, we'll see you tomorrow. Don't forget tonight at 7 o'clock is our Wednesday evening devotional, singing and, and devotional. And we'd love to have you in person or joining us over Facebook or YouTube, whichever is better for you. We'll see you tomorrow.